Hello and welcome to another episode of Curious Cat Crime Sunday. This is Shelby and today's episode is on John George Hay. If you enjoy my videos, please subscribe as I post every Monday and let's get to it. <laughs> Before I get into today's episode, I just want to tell you, I made this entire video, this entire video, with my mic off. So I had to delete everything, and now I'm going to start over again. Maybe I'll do better than I did last time, because I made a bit of a mess out of a few things. But anyways, let's get into it. Today's episode is on John George Hay. I don't know if it's hi or hey. I'm going to say it both ways so that either I'm wrong on one and right on the other, wrong on both or right on both. Who knows? But we're going to go with it. John George Hay was born July 24th, 1909 and died August 10th, 1949. So he was aged 40. He is commonly known as the acid, acid bath murderer and he was an English serial killer convicted of murdering six people. However, he claimed to murder up to nine. He both battered to death and shot his victims and disposed of their bodies using sulfuric acid before forging their signatures so he could sell all their possessions and make large sums of money. His actions were subject of a television show called A or television film called A is for Acid. And after reading this case and finding it very intriguing, I wouldn't mind watching that. So if you've seen it, please leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. All right, let's get into it. So early life of John Hay. He was born in Stamford, Lincolnshire, and that was raised in Ottawood, West Riding, Yorkshire. Um, his parents were engineer John Robert Hay and his wife, Emily, members of the Plymouth Brethren, a conservative Protestant sect. He later claimed that he suffered reoccurring religious nightmares in his childhood. He developed great proficiency at piano. I'm good at piano. I also taught myself, which is he learned at home. He was fond of classical music and often attended concerts. He won a scholarship to Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in Wakefield and then at Wakefield Cathedral. Zoe, don't leave. Zoe. Okay, maybe we won't have a cat this episode. Um, after school, he apprenticed at a form of firm of motor engineers and after a year he left the job and took a job in insurance and advertising age 21 he was dismissed after being suspected of stealing the cash box after being fired he moved on to forging car documents to which last time i had said okay you did one thing illegal or maybe you didn't you were accused of it and then you just decided hey i'm just gonna do all things illegal now <laughs> so on July 6, 1934, Hay married 23-year-old Beatrice Betty Hammer, and the marriage soon disintegrated. I wonder why. The same year that Hay was jailed for fraud, Betty gave birth to birth while he was in prison, and she placed the baby girl up for adoption and left Hayes. Or Hay, Hayes' conservative family ostracized him from then onward. Hay moved to London in 1936 and became a chauffeur to William McSwan, a wealthy owner of amusement arcades. He also maintained McSwan's amusement machinery. Thereafter, he pretended to be a solicitor named William Cato Adamson, to which in my last video with no mic on, I said what an interesting name to come up with, because if you told me to come up with a name, it would be something like generic and basic, but like that's like a very... Uh, thought through name if you ask me. He had offices in Chancery Lane, London, Guildford, Surrey, and Hastings, Sussex. He sold fraudulent shock shares, look she's back, purportedly from the estate of his deceased clients at below market rates. His scam was uncovered by someone who noticed the misspelling of G Guildford as Guilford, which in my first video again, I found funny because I had read it as Guilford and not Guildford. So, but that was on his letterhead. So you think if you're going to do a fraud and you're going to put so much effort into it, you should probably spell the name right. <laughs> um, anyways, High received a four-year prison sentence for fraud. High was released just after the start of the Second World War. He continued the fraudster and was sentenced to several further terms of imprisonment. Regretting that he had left his victims alive to accuse him, 
He became intrigued by French murderer Georges Alexandre Serret. Now, I tried to pronounce it correctly. I know I didn't. I'm sure I didn't. I did my best. And this is something I said in the previous video. I forgot to put it before now. I'm not good at American names and cities and places and items and things like that. Words are hard. But put me in a different country, I'm definitely going to mess it up. So please bear that in mind and don't be mad at me. I'm just really not good at pronunciations. Anyways, so he was uh, this person, this uh, killer, disposed of bodies using sulfuric acid, the French murderer. I experimented with field mice and after finding that it took only 30 minutes to dissolve the body and it found it only took 30 minutes to dissolve the body. High was freed from prison in 1943 and became an accountant with an engineer firm. Soon after, by chance, he encountered his former employee, William McSwan, at a Kingston pub. McSwan introduced Hyde to his parents, Donald and Amy, and... McSwan worked for them and collected rent on their London properties. High became envious of his lifestyle. On September 6, 1944, McSwan disappeared. I wonder what happened. High later admitted he had lured McSwan into a basement of his Gloucester Glue Glue Road, excuse me, hit him over the head with a lead pipe, and then put his body in a 40 imperial gallons. So, something I said in the previous report. If I'm ever in a different country and they're using forms of measurements, I will try to put an American form as well because, as my analytics say, most of you are from America, some of you are not, so I will keep it both ways. So it was 40 imperial gallons or 48 U.S. gallons, drawn with concentrate of sulfuric acid. Two days later, finding McSwan's body had mostly dissolved, Hay emptied the drum into a manhole that was in the building. He told McSwan's parents that his son had gone into hiding to Scotland to avoid being called up for the military service. Then, I began living in McSwan's house, collecting rent from McSwan's parents. They became curious as to why their son had not returned as the war was coming to an end. And on July 2nd, 1945, he lured them to the Gloucester Road by telling them their son was back from Scotland for a surprise visit. This is where he killed both of them with blows to the heads and disposed of them. Hyde then stole McSwan's pension checks and sold his parents' properties for around 8000 of the local money amount, moved in the Onslow Court Hotel in Kingston. Hyde was a gambler. By 1947, so if you remember, this is two years later, he was running short of money. To solve his financial problems, he found another couple to kill and rob, Archibald, love that name, Henderson, and wife Rose. After feigning interest in a house they were selling, he was invited to Henderson's flat by Rose to play piano for their housewarming party. While at the flat, High stole Archibald Henderson's revolver, planning to use it in his next crime. Renting a small workshop at 2 Leopold Road in Crowley, West Sussex, he moved acid and drums there from the Gloucester Road. High was also known to have stayed in Crowley's hotel, the George, on several occasions. I'm not sure why you need to know that, but in case you were wondering, he did. Um, on February 12, 1948, he drove Archibald Henderson to the workshop on the pretext of showing him an invention. And when he arrived, High shot him in the head with a stolen revolver. High then lured Rose Henderson to the workshop, claiming that her husband had fallen ill and he had shot her as well. After disposing of the Henderson's bodies in the oil drum filled with acid, he forged a letter with their signatures and sold off their possessions again for 8000 of the local money amount, except for their car and dog, which he kept. Well, I'm glad they didn't kill the dog. Um, High's next and last victim was Olive, Olive Duran Deacon, 69, a wealthy widow of solicitor John Duran Deacon and fellow student on the Enclave Court Hotel. Hi, I said student, didn't I? Fellow resident at the Onslow Court Hotel. Hi, by then had been calling himself an engineer, and Olive, Olive mentioned an idea to him that she had for artificial fingernails. He invited her down to Leopold Road Workshop on eight, February 18, 1949, and once inside, he shot her in the back of the neck with a 38 caliber Webley revolver that he had stolen from Archibald Henderson. Stripped for her values, including a Persian lamb coat, he put her in an acid bath. 
Two days later, Duran Deacon's friends Constant Lane recorded her missing. Detectives soon discovered Hayes' record of theft, fraud, and searched the workshop. Police found Hayes' attache case containing a dry cleaner's receipt for all of Duran Deacon's coat and also papers referring to the Hendersons and the McSwans. Why do you keep these things, people? <laughs> if you're doing bad things. I mean, I'm glad you did so we can catch you, but, I mean, not very smart. <clears throat> The work, the workshop in Sussex rented by Hyde did not contain a floor drain, unlike the workshop he had rented at Gloucester Road in London. He, therefore, disposed of the remains by pouring out the container on a pile of rubble in the back of the property. Investigating the area, pathologist Keith Simpson, if I can find a photo, I will place it on one side or the other, uh, revealed 23 pounds or 13 kilograms of body fat, part of a human foot, human gallstones, and part of a denture which was later identified by Olive Duran Deacon's dentist during the trial. Hay, was def uh, uh, Hay asked Detective Inspector Alex Webb, Albert Webb, I can read, I swear, I'm just reading my notes, uh, during questioning, tell me, frankly, what are the chances of anyone being released from Broadmoor? Now, if you don't know, Broadmoor is a highly security psychiatric hospital. The inspector said he could not discuss this sort of thing, so I replied, well, if, you told, if I told you the truth, you would not believe me. It sounds too fantastic to believe. By the way, fantastic back then does not mean wonderful. It means like crazy, as far as I'm concerned in that sentence. I then confessed that he killed Deacon Duran Deacon, the McSwans, and the Hendersons, as well as three other people, a young man named Max, a girl from Eastbourne, and the woman from Hammersmith. These three claims were not substantiated, okay? So it's just the Duran Deacon, the McSwans, which was uh, three of them, and the Hendersons, which was two. So High's trial was held at Lewis Aziz's. I know I said that wrong. There's no way that that's the correct way to pronounce that, but I tried and to read it. I don't want to say that because I'm going to get in trouble because it's got a bad word in it and I know I'll say it wrong. So anyways, evidence from the trial is now at the Crimes Museum in North Scotland Yard. I would love to go there one day. Um, High pleaded insanity claiming that he had drunk the blood of the victims. He said he had dreams dominated by blood as a young boy and when he was involved in a car accident in March 1944, his dreams returned to him. This is what he says of his dreams, okay? This is very deep to me and crazy and interesting. So he says, I saw before me a forest of crucifixes. These gr crucifixes gradually turned into trees. At first, it appeared to be dew or rain dripping from the branches, but as I approached, I realized it was blood. He said, the whole forest began to rise and the trees, dark and erect, to ooze blood. A man went to each tree catching the blood. The man is not him, it's a different guy. When the cup was full, he approached me and said, drink, he said, but I was unable to move. That's what he said his dream was, and it was a recurring dream. That's scary, even if it is true. The Attorney General, Sir Hartley Shawcross Casey, later Lord Shawcross, uh, led the prosecutor prosecution and urged the jury to reject High's defense of insanity because he had acted with malice afterthought. Sir David Maxwell Fifey KC defendant, defending called many witnesses to attest to High's mental state, including Henry Yalis, who claimed High's had a paranoid cons constitution, adding the absolute callous, cheerful, bland, and almost friendly indifference of the accused to the crimes which he freely admitted have committed the is unique in my experience i can talk i swear words are hard high apparently had believed mistakenly that the bodies if the bodies of the victims could not be found a murder conviction would not be possible it only took minutes for the jury to find him guilty mr justice Hemp, uh, humphreys sentenced him to death and on August 10, 1949, High was hanged by Executioner Albert Pierpoint. The case was one of the post-1945 cases which gained considerable coverage in the news even though High's guilt was not questioned. The editor of the Daily Mail, S Sylvester Bloom, was sentenced to three months prison term 
for contempt of court as describing High as a murderer while the trial was underway. So this is the story of John George High. I hope you found it interesting as I did because I do quite enjoy sometimes reading older cases that are lesser known because, you know, you've probably heard it all about Jeffrey Dahmer and, you know, John Wayne Gacy, things like that. But did you know about John George High? No? Okay. Well, if you did, I hope I did a good job in reference to the knowledge you already knew. I hope I taught you something. Um, if you didn't, I hope you enjoyed the story. If you do, please subscribe as I post every Monday at 7 or I used to post Sunday at 5, but I found it was better Monday at 7 for me. So even though my name's Curious Cat Crime Sunday, it is now Monday. <laughs> uh, kind of funny. But anyways, this is a story by Curious Cat Crime Sh Sunday with Shelby. And I hope you enjoyed it. Be good to each other, stay kind, and remember to be safe. Have a good week. Bye.